This week, CATL, the world's largest battery maker, announced their next generation battery for heavy duty vehicles, including buses, will last for up to 2.8 million kilometers of driving. That means the average amount of North America drives annually. The batteries will only last 140 years. However, the good news is that's approximately 138 years longer than the average Facebook meme claims EV batteries last. California is using robots to control wildfires. These are machines that create controlled burns to prevent future burns. It's like a Zamboni, but with fire instead of ice. And that's not really a joke. That's actually a very accurate description of what it is. India is spending a billion dollars plus to subsidize EVs, but only two and three wheeled EVs. Plus, and this is true, they are also electrifying the ambulances needed to pick up the injured riders of those dangerous contraptions that use only two and three wheels. The Hague becomes the first city in the world to ban fossil fuel advertising. This joke brought to you by Casper Mattresses. Casper, the finest name in podcast advertised mattresses. All that and more on this jam-packed edition of the Clean Energy Show. All right, it's time for Brian's Movie Corner. Brian's Movie Corner. All right, so this came up a few weeks ago, the movie Who Framed Roger Rabbit? Because General Motors and other companies way back in the 30s or 40s conspired to purchase and dismantle the L.A. transit system and other transit systems, uh, correct? Which was news to me, complete news to me. Yeah. And I had no idea. Yeah. So the plot of Who Framed Roger Rabbit is based on a real life event and general motors they paid like a thousand dollar fine or something like that <laughs> is that right um, well that that must yeah. have really taught them a lesson yeah but this is part of what led us down this path that we're in in north america of hugely car centric cities especially uh los angeles so anyway i decided to watch the movie again it's from 1988 and I'm going to play a clip here. This is Christopher Lloyd and Bob Hoskins. And this is that part of the movie where the bad guy uh, explains his dastardly plan to the, the good guy. Destruction plan of epic proportions. We are calling it a freeway. Freeway? What the hell is a freeway? Eight lines of shimmering cement running from here to Pasadena. Smooth, safe, fast. Traffic jams will be a thing of the past. Soon, where Toontown once stood will be a string of gas stations, inexpensive motels, restaurants that serve rapidly prepared food, tire salons, automobile dealerships, and wonderful, wonderful billboards reaching as far as the eye can see. My God, it'll be beautiful. Come on. Nobody's going to drive this lousy freeway when they can take the red car for a nickel. Well, they'll drive. They'll have to. You see, I bought the red car so I could dismantle it. Which is true. They did. Yeah. Which they is did. amazing. The, the red car was the, the transit system, the street cars that ran on rails, and they were uh, electric, and uh, it's all gone. So uh, Toontown is the name of the cartoon town in Who Framed Roger Rabbit, where the animated uh, characters are from, and also the nickname of Saskatoon, the city near us that uh, I sometimes visit. Toontown is called sometimes. Right. But, um, yeah, I don't know. It's uh, it's still not a very good movie. I, d I don't know. I never really liked it. I never it liked it, it either. And, I, I, yeah. I, it's, it's praised by a lot of people. Even in recent years, I keep hearing praise for it. But it, um, I mean, I'm not a movie critic. It just didn't rub me the right way. And But I, did you, did you now notice the plot a lot more considering where you are in life now compared to then? Like uh, the whole GM thing? Or do you remember that? Because I don't even remember that aspect of it. No, I don't remember that. It's and it it it's really not dealt with very much. Like it's really just it's kind of only mentioned twice, like at the beginning and and at the end. It's just generic bad guy plot. Like he's a maniac that wants to you know do something maniacal. But there must be a so, documentary on this whole thing, right? I mean the the whole yeah. plot by car companies to buy up transit so that they could take over the world. I would think so, yeah. But it's an amazing technical achievement, which is what I thought at the time. 
and maybe even more so now because it's 1988, it's pre-CGI, so they had to combine all these hand-drawn cartoons with live action, and it's really well pulled off. Like, it's quite spectacular how they managed to do that. We'll look for a, a documentary and if someone out there knows about one, or perhaps we'll, we'll have to make it ourselves. So I don't want to talk about this too much, uh, but, you know, James is often fantasizing about living somewhere else, living somewhere more progressive because we kind of live in the middle here of fossil fuel country and both sides of the political spectrum support fossil fuels and continuing fossil fuels. And one of the safe havens in our minds has always been British Columbia, the west coast of Canada, where Vancouver is, Vancouver Island, Victoria. It's always seemed like a much more progressive place and, and a place that I'm, you know, be interested in moving. But the, the premier of BC now is talking about getting rid of the consumer carbon tax. Well, he's under pressure from the conservatives for once, and they yeah. might lose that, and it would become a yeah. very significant shift. Like, the, the conservatives are actually fairly right-wing in a yeah. fairly left-wing um, mountainous community, you know, think Seattle or something like that. But yeah, it's sort of there's a there's a bunch of fall elections here in Canada and, you know, uh, Trudeau's carbon pricing and it's not a tax. It's a price on pollution, but his carbon tax. I don't know. Every, the, the other parties can smell blood in the water like this is maybe the, the thing. Well, that's yes, the defeat. cost of living, the the uh, interest rates have gone up and this is the time that they can finally attack the carbon tax when people are, yeah. you know, having trouble buying groceries and things like that. But it, it, the stupid thing is, is that we most jurisdictions get, you know, the money back and more. Most people get more yeah. money. So they're actually going to be worse off if you get rid of the carbon yeah. pricing on a consumer yeah. level. I mean, it, it affects industry as well. And then, then they say, yeah. well, it, it increases the price of groceries. It's like one penny or two pennies per hundred dollars. It's, it's, it's yeah. almost, you know, nothing. Like, yeah. you know, a breeze would, 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 a gentle breeze would raise the price that much. It's political posturing. It doesn't have anything to do with reality. And it reminded me of back in uh, 1991 is when the GST came in here in Canada. This is the goods and services tax. And this was the most unpopular thing I can ever remember per politically in my lifetime. It was a 7% sales tax federally on basically everything, goods and services. And it was brought in by Brian Mulroney, the conservative prime minister at the time in 1991. And this, the, I mean, nobody wants to pay 7% more for everything. So this was roundly hated. And then two years later, he lost the election or the conservatives lost the election in the greatest defeat ever in the history of Canadian or possibly world politics. But they we've been through several election up. cycles federally since it was brought in. And I was kind of surprised by it because there was a because, you know, the opposition parties would call it a tax and that sort of, you know, even journalists call it a carbon tax. And we've been accused of, yeah. of joining that parade because we're so used to hearing that that sort of term. But uh, it's really frustrating that, you know, that's happened and it's it's made it through several elections. And now it's like time to kill it, which is, and it's proven yeah. to work. And other countries yeah. in the world are looking to do it. And uh, BC's had it for longer than the federal government has, and they've we, most of the data in the world comes from BC to prove that it works. So it, yeah. it's not perfect. It's not an end-all solution. It's part of a puzzle of of addressing climate change, but it's a free market, uh, in in a sense, right wing way of addressing the problem because you, the market has to adjust, and it and it does. It's stupid. It's it's, it's incredibly um, wrong to to attack something that's working and, and in fact doesn't, you know, it does not in fact yeah. hurt your pocketbook. And the difference, of course, like the GST was hated by pretty much everyone, but people do support a price on carbon. So it's not universally loathed, but as I say, the other parties can seem to smell blood in the water. Now this September, Brian, where we live here in Canada, used to getting cool pretty quick. When Labor Day comes, summer ends for us here. Not this year. Uh, last year, it was a warm night, and there was a thunderstorm in the middle of the night. It felt like summer. I'm, I'm actually confused. My, <laughs> my, whatever it is that my seasonal uh, um, instincts are all out of whack. It's like, you know, having the midnight sun or something, and it's just wrong. And now, tonight, is going to go down to uh, 
barely room temperature. It's not even going to get cold. It could, we could be having snow this time of year. I mean, brief snow, like flurries that melt instantly, but it's happened. We've had frost this time of year. And, and tonight I'm going to uh, have to turn on the air conditioning because we have a wind that makes me downwind from the oil refinery, which I just closed my window. I'm really aware of winds now with my um, air filtration system or my um, air purifier that kicks on. The big expense of it is it has an air detection unit that detects bad things. And sure enough, the oil refinery is one of those bad things. And when I wake up in the middle of the night and I see that thing blasting full and the lights are flashing, I have to get up and close my window, which interrupts my sleep. But then I'm breathing in. I'm good. It's just, I wish, no I, I, I wish the world would embrace EVs and that damn place would shut down. And, you know, there's a, there's a, an instance in the States where there's a, um, a pipeline that blew up that is right next to a residential area. That's just like me. You know, pipelines nice. aren't supposed to be next to residential areas, but it's it's very much the same. So what's different about them is they have a, um, you know, a corridor for power, electricity. So the electricity is down as well. But all those people, I mean, I don't know, hundreds had to evacuate. That could be me one day. Uh, and they're just letting the, the natural gas uh, blow out of the pipeline, and that's going to take an undetermined amount of time. Brian, in Alberta, there's a place called Charge Stop, a business, a uh, franchise business, which opened its first location. It is essentially a gas station without gas, and I've been waiting for this day for a long time, which is why I mention it. Yeah, the yeah. name of the place is called Charge Stop, and they have uh, the intention of 25 locations across Canada by the end of next year. And they are doing charging really well, but it's pricey. It's, it's even pricier than a Tesla for non-Tesla users, which is, yeah, it's pricey. But you can go in and you can buy stuff and there's washrooms. That's the two things you need. And I, I'd love to start a business like this and have it yeah, just perfect, just delicious food yeah. and, and uh, perfect washrooms and, you know, all kind. that would be perfect a real, for a charge stop. There, there's a real art to knowing where the good bathrooms are to stop on yeah. a road trip. Oh. It's, it's super important. And I think people sort of mentioned that in their um, reviews on PlugShare and other apps where you rate the chargers. Uh, we were recently asked by a listener to find podcasts on the Chinese auto, ma auto market and supply chain advantage that they have. And uh, this isn't the perfect example, but I did come across Michael Dunn on a podcast. Not that a podcast that I listened to, but I saw it promoted and I got interested about it. It is actually a Canadian podcast called The Change Optimist. It is uh, a small podcast that does interviews uh, from time to time. And uh, he was on there. I'm going to play a clip. This is Michael Dunn because he's he spent decades since the mid-80s in Asia as an auto analyst working for uh, different companies. And he's moved around Asia, including China, and he has a very, you know, good opinion that he was born in Detroit. His dad was uh, worked for the auto uh, market there. And yeah, he's got lots of interesting things and a perspective. There is a big story to tell. And what makes it really fascinating is that to a large extent, Americans and Canadians have not yet gotten the memo. And what I mean by that is there's been an earthquake, a transformation in the global auto industry. China is now the center, whether we like it or not, whether we're ready to accept it or not, by every measure, capacity. They have capacity to supply half the world's demand. They produce twice, three times as much as the United States. They export more than anyone else in the world. They build more EVs than all other countries combined. The battery and battery supply chain totally dominated by China. And yet here we sit in North America, in Canada and the United States and think, what? But the reality is we're on an island here. And if you go to Europe or Southeast Asia, or Latin America, you're going to see a surprising number of Chinese cars more every month. Yeah, you can get the full interview and um, on uh, what's it called? The Change Optimist podcast. A link hopefully will show up in your show notes if our writer decides to put it in there and when i say writer i mean the ai gods who do our writing for us now <laughs> china is the number one supplier of vehicles in mexico already brian and the north america i had no idea uh number north america supply chain is non-existent he says mineral extraction and refining to just to catch up would take five to seven years to get up to speed and Michael Dunn says they would go with the dealership model, China, like BYD, for example, in North America. 
because they'd want to build allies. But ultimately, since they own everything, including the ships, which we've talked about, they're building their own ships to transport the cars. Talk about owning your supply chain. I mean, my God, uh, they would want to probably go to a direct-to-consumer model like Tesla. Uh, he's guessing eventually because they want to own everything. But uh, initially, they would have probably a dealership model too. And I think they're doing that in other parts of the world as well. You know, South America, Africa, Europe. But since the, uh, yeah... So, uh, you know, Michael, just this morning, just before the show, uh, had a tweet, and I thought I'd read it to you. He says, China's stunningly low car prices are a product of a unique national arsenal, tough to match anywhere else in the world. He lists it. Uh, scale, speed, the speed at which they come out, which is can be a detriment because sometimes they overlook things. But generally speaking, we don't know what the long-term reliability is yet, but we will get data on that soon. Supply chains, of course, subsidies, of course, from the Chinese government, but he says they're also in survival mode 24-7. They are working really hard. In other words, they're working a lot harder than our sorry-ass automakers here are, who, yeah. Subsidies are not an insignificant add-on, he says. They are central to the plot. He says, uh, to live another day, global automakers must pivot to extreme urgency, which they are not, Brian, at all, and make that shift into survival mode. This is not a rehearsal, and here is my hot take. Yeah, it's a James Whittingham hot take. The 100% tariffs that America and Canada placed on Chinese EVs in the last year will kill, kill the North American automaker uh, not save them. It was before the tariff, they were working hard to catch up. Now, they put their feet up and said, well, we'll just see what the market does. Well, guess what? Yeah. The market everywhere else is changing. Uh, if you can buy a quality EV for less, for even half as much, my God, you're toast. Goodbye, automakers. So if you work in the auto market, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I think it's, 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 it's putting your finger in a leaky dike and it, the water's going to come rushing in eventually. This is not going to change anything. They can be protected, but maybe only for so long. All right. From Bloomberg, we have a machine here that I have dubbed the Zamboni of fire prevention because that's pretty much what it is. It's a, uh, it's called the burn bot. It's a tank light robot that helps manage wildfire. Whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah. I think we need to explain what a Zamboni is because <laughs> oh, yeah, even that's our right. American listeners won't know what a Zamboni is. Uh, most of them. Yeah. I apologize. It's a ice resurfacing machine that is uh, very common here in Canada, the, you know, the home so of it, it's, ice uh, what's the, What exactly sports. do they do? Do you know, as a former hockey person, do they scrape the ice and put water down? Do they melt the ice? Yeah. Do they sweep it's it? It's a small kind of truck that's got a bunch of hot water in it. And it, yeah, it scrapes the ice, uh, picks up any snow that's on the ice, and then lays down a fresh sheet of water onto so the ice. So in between periods of a hockey game, there's three periods in a hockey game, yeah. you would uh, bring that on before the game. And after, and they remove the nets and do that. And the, this is the most glorious job of the slow movie machine. Some guy gets to do that for a living. And uh, yeah. that, that just happens. We also talked about electric Zambonis as an aside. But yeah. because, you know, you're burning diesel or gas inside a building. And that could be problematic, which it was for one of our local rinks here in a small town recently. Yeah, no, I remember that. As a kid, watching the Zamboni drive around the rink and smelling the fumes and thinking, wait a minute, we're not supposed to run cars indoors, are we? No. Uh, never mind, kid. Just get <laughs> on the ice. Uh, but yeah, so it is a the burn bot, a tank-like robot. It uses less manpower. It's um, sort of like remote controlled. And it has, yeah, kind of the same size as a Zamboni, maybe a little bit bigger. It's, you know, the size of a small truck. And um, instead of laying down a fresh surface of ice, it, it's a controlled burn right underneath this machine. And uh, it leaves a path of burnt stuff and leaves, I don't know, very minimal smoke. Um, there's a lot of advantages to it. We have to really start thinking about what to do to manage wildfires, yeah. uh, as we know, like there's just been an insane increase in wildfires because of uh, climate and we, change. And we let the forest just grow because we didn't want them to burn. And that yeah. was a problem in Jasper National Park in Canada. 
this summer. Yeah. A great deal of it burned, and it was very unfortunate. But it, we also yeah. just left it because we didn't want it to burn. We wanted people to enjoy it. Well, now they've got nothing to enjoy. Yeah. Now, uh, a lot of the climate change deniers will sort of jump on the Jasper story and say, oh, it's just bad forest management. That's the only reason that it all burned, because you do have to manage forests, especially ones that are near cities and controlled burns. Are also, a thing it costs that money have, to do that. And people don't we, but we it want costs to money to do that all the time. Yeah. So, you know. Yes, for the last uh, you know hundred years or so, we have probably prevented too many forest fires, and so the dry tinder kind of builds up. But of course, without the extra dryness and hotness of climate change, uh, these fires would not be uh, sparking uh, quite so much. So yeah, this is a nearly smokeless machine. Apparently, like it it combusts these things uh, so well at such high temperatures that it kind of burns the smoke, and it can be used in dry conditions. So one of the problems with controlled burns is you can't do it when it's too dry you out. Have to because you have to adjust the right the conditions for it. And, yeah. and sometimes the weather shifts and things go badly. But yeah, this is very controlled. And I, I don't know how they achieved the smokelessness of it, but it's very cool that they do that. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's quite wild. Um, it's, uh, there was a statistic here about, um, you know, the, the wildfires in uh, Canada this year have been so huge. It was like, uh, oh, now I can't find it. Give me a second here. <laughs> uh, anyway, there's only a few of these uh, machines, but it seems there's like two a promising technology. There's two of them. Yeah, there's only two of and them. And there's a crew that but, sort of goes around and makes sure that there's no flames around. But for the most part, it's got this steel roller on the back, and it's just a little bit of smoking bush with, that's left behind which is kind of cool. Yeah. And, you know, we really have to rethink all of this kind of forest management strategy. So, you know, Jasper, this town in Canada that a lot of it burned down, and we have other amazing mountain towns in the Rockies that are vulnerable. And, uh, you know, hopefully somebody is looking at um, all of these issues. Sprinklers sometimes, like certain buildings or communities are sometimes protected by sprinklers. Right. And perhaps we need those kinds of barriers. But here's the statistic from the article I thought was wild. Last year, wildfires in Canada spewed more CO2 than all of Mexico. Because the problem with these wildfires is that they also expel CO2 into the atmosphere, which is a greenhouse gas, which just... They're uh, basically you know, storing the CO2 and then releasing yeah. it when they burn. Yeah, it's, uh, I don't know, it's a real problem. And I think about it in terms of, I'm still hoping to build uh, a new cottage at our lake property. It's in a forest. It's a boreal forest in a provincial park. And we never worried too much about forest fires when I was a kid. But again, like that forest has been protected now for a very long time because it's a provincial park. And, uh, you know, at a certain point, it could all go up in smoke. And, yeah. and maybe we need to, I mean, it, it, if we build a rammed earth cottage, that will be somewhat fire resistance. But, you know, the entire thing isn't rammed earth. There's, there'd still be some wood in the construction. So I don't know. I think we have to think about that. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've often thought about that myself. Like, um, what would I do in an area like that if I had a home? I mean, a metal uh, roof is, is possibly one thing, but then you've got, um, sort of like what a lot of what happens is that uh, the windows explode. I'm, I've only recently learned this is that the, it gets hot and then the windows explode and then the, the ambers go right inside the dwelling. So whatever you have in there is, uh, you know, but also you, you might have to do forest management at your cottage. I remember being out there when you let us stay there during the pandemic that there was extreme fire threats and it actually was on my mind, you know, like, because yeah. I think there was only one road out for one thing, and and I was you know had that in the back of my mind what would happen because yeah there was lots of lightning strikes and things and things were tinder dry some years yeah when it's very dry you know they they have a ban you're not allowed to have a campfire and stuff like that but I don't get the feeling that anyone is really thinks it's going to happen uh, but you know they, they probably didn't think that was going to happen in Jasper either and it's an unusual place it's on the middle of the prairies on a high elevation yeah. with um, it's like this little plateau that has this forest uh, for, yeah. I don't know how many kilometers square, miles square, but it's uh, sort of this oasis of uh, forest in the middle of the prairie. And it would be a shame if that went up, but I felt like yeah. it could have, you know. <laughs> and 
when I was a kid, they had a fire tower in the park, Did which they? was common really? back in the 60s and 70s, a large fire tower, and they would employ people to sit up there and watch for forest fires. Wow. Uh, that tower has been gone for a couple of decades. It burned so. down. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> but I don't know, maybe they monitor with cameras or something. I, I don't know. Well, that still would require a tower then, you know, because uh, there are still fire towers and most of them are automated now with cameras. Uh, and yeah, they use AI the, to detect them. The Bloomberg article cites, you know, basically fire tech is one of the new frontiers in technology. So there are companies working on things like uh, drones, autonomous drones that can uh, spot uh, wildfires. But uh, a related story here also from Bloomberg is the world's most desperately needed airplane is back in production. And this is called the Canadair, and this is a water bomber. And I don't know if I have to explain this like I have to explain a Zamboni, uh, because these are fairly common around here, but it's an airplane that can skim a lake, pick up a bunch of water very quickly, and then it flies over the forest fire. It it's dumps a flying some water. tanker. Yeah, it, it, yeah. It's, a, it's a big plane that lands on water very quickly, scoops up water, shuts its hatch, and somehow takes off again and doesn't crash. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I don't know how they do that. They must have little baffles in there. Um, yeah. But it also must pump it in there if they have the baffles. They can't do any scooping. But yeah, and then it takes off and it's very maneuverable. And I guess they haven't been in production in 10 years or something like that. Exactly. But And uh, this is made by de Havilland Aircraft of Canada. And they were able to line up enough orders to put the plane back into production with uh, countries around the world are ordering enough planes that, uh, yeah, this is going back into production. So this is another thing we're going to be using in the new reality of forest fires. It's only 20 bathtubs full, but still. Yeah. It I, seems I to work. I think it's the fact that it can reload so quickly. It literally just skims yeah. the water to pick up the water. There are other planes, but they have to land at an airport and, and fuel with fire retardant stuff, and it takes time. Yeah. I've seen it, the process happen. It's it, it's not fast. Yeah, and we use helicopters for that as well. Helicopters that have some kind of a, a big kind of uh, tank hanging yeah. off the bottom of it. Last time I was in Banff water. National Park in Canada, I was camping, and there was this, there was a fire over the other side of the ridge and you would see the helicopters with buckets flying over. Yeah. And of yeah. course that just made you more concerned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The climate change has made me run from fires, Brian, even at your cottage. Yeah. Like I'm just, it's a new reality we live in. The fact that I'm sweating here in the middle of my podcast morning and uh, it's mid September and I should be cool and have a nice, uh, nice autumn breeze coming in. And yet I'm, um, I'm too hot to maybe even make it through the whole show this week. I'm, I might have to have you go on without me. So about 20 years ago, we rented a helicopter and a helicopter pilot to shoot some film for a short film that I was doing. And it was hard to find. There's not a lot of helicopters around here 20 years ago, certainly. There's a few more now. But we had to get a guy that was fighting forest fires in northern Saskatchewan on his way home to Calgary. He was based in Calgary and we made the inquiries and he's like, oh yeah, I can stop in Regina. And we spent an afternoon with him shooting film off of his uh, helicopter, which now you can do with a, you know, a $200 drone. $200 but back drone. in the day, it was a very expensive uh, venture to rent a helicopter and, sh and shoot yeah. 35 millimeter film from it. I had this friend named Scott Watson. I know a few of our film alumni are listening. So I mentioned him by name. And he's a very successful um, film person in Vancouver now and Hollywood occasionally. And he was very ambitious, like some people were in film school, with making action movies, going way beyond what they should be doing with zero money and experience. And he rented a helicopter. And I, that was just yes. legendary. <laughs> I remember that, yes. <laughs> $500 an hour back then. Uh, and I'm sure it's uh, four, five, six, seven times that now. Barry would know. Um, but yeah, drone, drone, you can go buy and, and, and use it in infinitely. And you know, the batteries in that with the Maya, yeah. they're getting better. You can use them for three times, almost three times what you used to be able to use them for. Pretty sweet. Yeah. And I, I got some advice from Barry, if you're listening, Barry, about how to shoot the helicopter stuff and what equipment to get. We had to rent this nose mount thing, which had to be mounted to the oh, helicopter. Where did like you get the nose to... mount thing? That had to come in from somewhere far away. It had to come in from Vancouver. The camera came in from Vancouver. It had to be bolted to the nose of the helicopter. My God, what a ridiculous operation. <laughs> and the guy was okay with you bolting it to his, his helicopter? 
Oh yeah, standard thing. So like it's, it's one it's of like the things a that helicopter pilots on a on a scuba yeah. gear or something now. Like okay, yeah, it's just... no, it's 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 they're made to go on helicopters. And back then, especially twenty years ago, that would have been you know one of the jobs you would do as a helicopter pilot is shooting for movies. Okay, well we got to move along here. CATL, the world's largest battery maker, based in China, uh, they have a large um, you know. Uh, lead over everyone else. BYD is second, but quite a few percentage points behind. Info from the story, Brian, is from Electric. It is from Bloomberg. It is from the CNEV Post and Interesting Engineering, and maybe even some other places because I had to, not everybody, not each of these stories covered everything I wanted to talk about. So I had to go to other places. I actually watched the live stream of CATL from an auto show in Hamburg, which wow. just came up on my YouTube while I was having lunch the other day. And yeah, they had a presentation. This is about uh, the batteries, not for transport EVs that you and I would drive, but for buses and for large equipment, anything like right up to shipping. Okay. So this is a different category, two categories, buses and heavy duty vehicles and ships. So these new technologies, they got new name for the technologies. And uh, this is including a battery that lasts 15 years and 2.8 million kilometers lifespan at an event in Germany that they talked about, and it would kind of withstand 72 hours of water immersion and get to 60% state of charge in 12 minutes, 70% state of charge in 15 minutes. So they have a long lifespan version of these batteries, and then they have a fast charging, whatever works for you. If you have a very fast charging, it's going to short your lifespan, but for your business, it may, might make sense. Uh, bus batteries uh, from them now last 15 years or 1.5 million kilometers. That's 20% improvement over the last generation of batteries. And God knows when that came out, maybe 12 months ago. I don't know the way they're moving so fast. It is warranted for 1 million kilometers or 10 years, and it will enter mass production soon. 13 companies are standing by waiting for this. I remember reading a story about buses, electric buses coming to our city, and I couldn't find it. I spent a lot of time trying to find that story. Couldn't find it for some reason. They mentioned that yeah. part of the expense was replacing the battery after eight years. And I was really surprised by that and discouraged by that. Uh, and it didn't, yeah. didn't seem right. This, this is a Canadian company that's making these, um, a Nova form or something like that is making these electric buses. Uh, so it will enter mass production very soon. This is another thing, you know, when we hear about, um, battery improvements, it's always like, you know, we'll get to it someday, sometime this decade with the Chinese market moving as fast as they do. It's like weeks or months before you actually see it in products by the time they announce it. So yeah, entering mass production soon. 13 companies are already standing by waiting for this before they even announced it. 175 watt hours per kilogram, that's the energy density, that's important. You don't need to know how that compares, but it is a 22% increase in energy density from their last generation of bus battery, which means you can store more energy in the same weight and volume of uh, the battery space that it takes up. Always very important. Also, this is good for us. It works in minus 35 Celsius. So wow. totally certified to work to that low of a temperature uh, and also hot temperatures, which doesn't concern us as much, but it does work in very high humidity, you know, both extremes of temperature scale on earth. Uh, CATL accounted for 31.6% of global EV battery sales in the second quarter of this year. And BYD was second with a mere 14.7% of global battery sales, but CATL is leading and it's incredible what they're doing, Brian, because they have so many people working on this. They have something like 21,000 engineers, not assistants, lab assistants, 21,000 engineers, chemical engineers working on improving batteries. 21,000, that's a city. And if you include the yeah. support workers for that, it truly is a, a modest sized city of people working literally around the clock because they are monitoring the test to see how new chemistries work around the clock and people actually monitor that in the labs. Um, yeah, it's just incredible what they're doing and just taking off really quickly. All right, I guess it's time to dip into the mailbag. All right, this letter is from Richard. Hi, James and Brian, I really like your show. 
On your September 4th show, a listener wanted other resources. You likely have heard of these, or at least some of them. In addition to your show, some shows I also really like are the Fully Charged Show, Everything Electric. Those are kind of the same thing. The brand started as the Fully Charged Show, and they're trying to transition to Everything Electric. I guess they think that's a, a better name or a brand. Uh, also, Monroe Live. It's a YouTube and a different podcast that fe appears to feature various experts. Uh, he says uh, he hasn't listened to the podcasts. Um, the YouTube videos tend to be very technical and are varied with experts, and they do full series of videos with full teardowns of EVs, as well as some surface-level overviews. If someone really wants to go in-depth and learn about how well-made various EVs are and how they work. Uh, daily Charge Up, just started listening to this one based on recommendations, a very short daily podcast with the latest news. All About Disruptions, which is a show on YouTube. Rethink X, who we've mentioned many times. Uh, it's an overview of disruptions that are coming and uh, connecting the dots, more about disruptions. So uh, regards, Richard. Um, I mean, first off, you should listen to the Clean Energy Show. But if you have some spare time, there's a few other uh, options there for you. All right. This letter is from Chuck. Hey, guys. I heard a story on Minnesota Public Radio about gas cooktops being a factor in causing asthma. And I already have asked a couple of my friends to do research, I th think, um, to confirm that I've heard uh, uh, just what I've heard. Uh, and I've used – so I'm going to read that again because uh, – um, Chuck uses uh, sort of voice to text because probably of some uh, vision impairment. I already have asked a couple of my friends to do research to confirm what I think I heard. But if you have any information about um, cooking cooktops and linkage to asthma, I'd be interested to hear. I unfortunately have a gas cooktop myself. And I think that my sister has asthma, has a cooktop also. But it is a question of maybe getting it if uh, there is a problem with us, uh, or more people being aware of it. There are plans for appliances which can include changing out their gas cooktops to be electric induction instead, as soon as is financially and practically possible for them to own their own, um, depending on their own situation and household. Yeah, I agree. I think that if you have a gas cooktop, uh, based on what we know, we should change to induction. As also, we, we talked about induction is faster and more efficient, and there isn't actually an advantage to gas. There's a, you know, with all the cooking show porn that's on the, the Food Network these days, people decided that gas was a thing in the last 20 years to, to make better cooking for you foodies out there. Not true, though. Yeah, we've covered this before. There's been a lot of spending by the natural gas industry to make you think that gas is somehow better for cooking. It is absolutely not. We got rid of our gas cooktop about two years ago, put in induction. The induction is fantastic. We love it. There is no reason to go uh, back to gas. I'm sure, as we've said before, certain chefs definitely would have a preference for gas. This is probably what they're used to and, uh, you know, it might be difficult for them to switch. But uh, no, gas, burning gas in your home, it's a terrible idea. Terrible idea. And, you know, if you have a gas cooktop, you're not going to have that 220 volt um, system there, the the wire, um, right? Yeah. Did you have one? We had to... No, we didn't. So the first thing I did when starting to do these upgrades was upgrade our electrical service from 100 amps to 200 amps. So yeah, we may not have been able to do that. So it's not like this is a cheap thing. Like uh, there are some induction cooktops coming out that um, can use a regular circuit. With they a battery. They have a battery to, to, yeah, to get that's up right. to. Yeah. yeah, it's actually quite interesting. Plus, and I think same you, with, could, you could use it when the power goes out for a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, you know, heat pump water heaters, that's that's an issue as well. You sometimes need a lot of power for those, but some are coming out that can use a regular uh, breaker. But, yeah, it, it's not going to be necessarily easy for everybody, but we definitely did it here. So, yeah, Chuck, uh, studies have shown that gas stoves raise the risk of childhood asthma by 30%. I mean, it's not a guarantee that if you grew up in a gas stove home that you're going to have asthma, but, of course, the gas leaks that's one of the issues, not only the cooking, but just a slow leak that's there all the time. I swear I could smell a tinch of natural gas in my in my laundry room or the water heater and furnaces sometimes, so I keep yeah. the door closed. Um, yeah, so there's uh, studies have also found that unburned natural gas leaks from stoves, and this gas contains benzene, a known carcinogen. So beyond asthma, there's that. There's the carcinogens in the gas 
that can cause bad disease. As you know, a 2013 meta-analysis of 41 studies found that gas cooking increases the risk of asthma in children, and the NO2 exposure is linked with currently having a wheeze. Most recently, a study published last December found that 12.7% of childhood asthma cases in the United States can be attributed to gas stove use. So varying degrees there, but the answer is absolutely yes, it can cause asthma. Uh, by the way, we had a previous episode, at least one on the uh, one episode on this, and that is episode 152 from February 2023, and the link is in your show notes there. If you want, also the link to what I think is the story that Chuck was listening to, the NPR thing, uh, is there. It's called There's a Battle Over Your Gas Stove and Climate Change and etc. is there as well. Yeah, even if you don't believe in climate change, why are we burning things that cause pollution that are unpleasant, unhealthy? Especially pollution in your own home. Where in your own home. kids get diseases. All right, another letter here from David. Guys, great show today. This is the September 12th show he's talking about. I totally agree with your comment on getting folks to drive our EVs to dispel all the FUD, the misinformation put out by those entrenched in the fossil fuel economy. My 34-year-old son needed a car, so I offered him my three-year-old Chevy Bolt, which is an electric car that James has as well. It was a great car with no issues, even with the battery recall. I completely enjoyed driving it. He said, no. He wanted a gas-powered car. I told him to think about it as I was not going to buy any more gas cars. He was willing to drive the car for two weeks while my wife and I were on vacation. Over vacation, I thought about his situation and decided maybe I should give him our five-year-old Subaru Ascent since he has a wife and three kids. However, when I returned and offered him the Ascent, he turned it down. He was in love with the Bolt. Our electric prices in town are about $0.08 cents a kilowatt hour, so his costs were 25% of a gas-powered car, uh, not including the lower maintenance costs, which would have been something like $0 for three years of driving the Bolt to about $300 for a gas car just for the oil changes. Keep up the great show, and by the way, while riding my bike around town today and listening to your show, I could smell the gas exhaust of the cars that passed me. Why would anyone want a gas car knowing we can clean up the air with electrics. Go figure. Thanks for the letter, David. Amen, David. That is absolutely true. And, uh, you know, my son's got problems with his car. He just had his uh, alternator fixed on his gas car and it's broken again. And he's really upset about that. And um, I, I used to have that problem all the time, Brian. And sometimes yep. it was the regulator. Sometimes it was a battery. Sometimes it was the alternator. Regular thing. And uh, I'm so glad to say goodbye to that. Ancient history now. When, when people talk to me about their problems with, oh, I needed, yeah, a new spark plug, like my eyes just glaze over because this is like, <laughs> I, I've been driving electric for almost five years now, and it this is just ancient history, and we need to move past it. We love to hear from our listeners. Please contact us by email, cleanenergyshow at gmail.com, and you can also leave us an online voicemail message at speakpipe.com slash show. All right, from Electrek, The Hague is the first in the world to ban fossil fuel advertising, uh, but not just for fossil fuels themselves, but also for highly polluting services like airline and cruise vacations, fossil gas suppliers, and best of all, gasoline powered vehicles. You can no longer advertise gas powered cars uh, in The Hague. So this will apply to mainly outdoor advertising in the form of billboards, displays in outdoor walking areas, ads on and inside the transit, and so on. The Hague had previously announced its intent to be climate neutral by 2030, so the city finds this to be a necessary step towards that goal. The Hague wants to be climate neutral by 2030, then it is inappropriate to allow advertising for products from the fossil industry. Fortunately, the city council now recognizes this, says the spokesman for Party for the Animals, uh, which is, I guess, a party over there, which sounds a bit like a punk band or something. It does. It does. So uh, the country is also among the best in electric car present, uh, penetration with just under half of new vehicles uh, being electric. Um, but the bad news is, unfortunately, the Netherlands... Uh, stands behind other countries in the area 
in per capita emissions because despite their heavy use of bicycles and EVs, of course, bicycles are huge, each Dutch person emits about 50% more CO2 than the citizens of nearby France, UK, or Denmark, and twice as much as nearby Sweden. And this is because they still have a lot of dirty uh, coal and fossil gas on their uh, electricity grid. Yeah. And diesel cars were big there, and now they're not, right? So uh, I guess, you know, the one thing about the Netherlands is that they have an advantage of uh, that I hadn't thought of before, was that when you're a leader in this area, uh, if everyone did it at the same time, gas cars would be of no value. But now they can just ship them to els elsewhere in Europe that are still using gas and diesel vehicles. Well, they go to 100% electric. Uh, quickly, Brian, India has approved a two-year scheme with an outlay of $1.3 billion U.S. to provide incentives for increased adoption of electric vehicles as the South Asian nation works to improve its air quality. Big issue in India, indoor and out even. Uh, Two-wheelers account for 56% of the 3 million registered EVs in, in India. So EV sales have jumped 45% in the fiscal year, year that ended March 2024. Annual sales could hit a 10 million uh, unit uh, threshold by 2030. Uh, subsidies have been provided to incentivize electric two- and three-wheel uh, vehicles, as well as e-ambulances and e-trucks. So they're staying away from passenger vehicles with four wheels and concentrating on that for some reason, uh, very specifically not doing that. The scheme is expected to support about 2.48, well, let's call it 2.5 million electric two-wheelers, 316,000 uh, e e-three-wheelers, and 14,000 e-buses, which sounds like a lot, but not in India. It's a big, well, the biggest country in the world. Electric cars and hybrid vehicles have been excluded, and there is a link to the story if you want to read more. Yes, and uh, electrifying two- and three-wheel vehicles, as we've said before, is a huge step, and especially in a place like India. All right, on a similar topic from Electrek, some news from Norway that we talk about a lot because they are pioneers in electric vehicles and electric vehicle penetration. We know that new car sales in Norway are, I think, above 95% all electric now, which is fantastic. But, of course, that doesn't replace the entire installed fleet it's still you know even with 100 percent ev sales there's still you know gas and diesel cars that are going to be on the road for uh, a while yet but it's i don't know surprisingly good news um so the good news part is evs have just surpassed gas cars in terms of the installed base on the road so there's about 750,000 evs on the road in norway and about 750,000 gas cars and because the evs are selling so well that basically the tipping point is right about now in the middle of september there's expected to be more uh, evs on the road than gas cars about now the bad news is they still have about a million diesel cars so the diesels still outnumber and the diesel and the gas together still outnumber the the uh, the gas cars diesel of course much more popular in Europe and, and Scandinavia so uh, but still I don't know I thought that was hugely encouraging like you know we talk about how long it's going to take to change the fleet over that's not bad progress that's a basically about a third of the fleet um, is electric now in Norway and honestly why would you want to drive a combustion vehicle if you Surely in Norway, you've had a taste of EVs either with cabs or with uh, car rentals or with friends uh, and neighbors. Uh, who wants to go back, Ryan? No one. Let's have a lightning round. The lightning round is a fast paced look at the latest headlines in climate clean energy and transportation. Spain's Prime Minister commits 40 million euros to subsidize e-bikes and expand public bike share schemes. He also called for the uh, country's mayors to stop seeing the bicycle as an ideological symbol and to recognize its true mobility as an alternative for urban mobility. That's nice to hear from a country leader, Brian, to... Uh, to say, hey, stop demonizing something. It's, uh, bikes are not an ideo ideological symbol. Uh, they have great potential for urban mobili mobility. CNN Upstart. This is from CNN Upstart um, Solar Farm to take over a transmission line from a dying 
uh, Minnesota coal plant. We've heard of this before. The coal plants die, they go out of business, they're not profitable, but they have this big grid connection, right? For almost yeah. nuclear power size. And so you just walk in with your solar panels and set up shop and you're good to go. And batteries as well. And by the way, batteries are really taking off in uh, solar farms because, and here's another thing, um, you know, like, I'll take like the first solar farms we had around here were 10 megawatts, which weren't very big. And I went and looked at one yeah. by Weyburn and they, they said that they were, the, the peak output of it was 13, 1.3 meg, uh, you know, 13 megawatts instead of 10. Uh, they wanted to make as much power as they could. Well, they have that 10 megawatt grid connection. That's the most they can put out. But in the rest of the day, maybe they can put out more than they otherwise would. But when you bring in batteries, you can still sell more power to the grid because then you're selling it at night or in the morning when the sun isn't at its peak. And you yeah. can still have that grid connection and still sell more of your product, which is great. Yeah. If, if there's a limit to the grid connection with a battery, you can basically be pumping out the energy at the grid limit the whole time. And that's why people are doing that. If you build solar, you build batteries. 95% lower fuel costs for battery electric gasoline speedboats. Um, so if you take your speedboat and make it electric, you're saving 95% cost. <laughs> that is the biggest cost that I know of in electrifying something because I know people who go out and water ski, they, they spend a lot of money on gas in just one day. Oh, yeah. And my, my brother-in-law insisted that I we, we pay money for going out in his boat, just to go on his boat without the water skiing. Uh, both make the same round trip um, in uh, Stockholm and Finnish uh, Island Island. This was a 278-kilometer trip. The gas cost 750 euros for fuel, but the battery electric speedboat cost 40 to 50 euros. That's 95% lower. So if you got a speedboat, might be a lot cheaper to go electric and a lot quieter. Our world's largest sailing cargo ship delivers 1,000 tons of cognac and champagne to New York City. This is the first time in 100 years a cargo ship crosses the Atlantic, mostly by wind. It has a diesel backup. And oh, it's time for a CS Fast Fact. New nuclear being added to the energy mix worldwide adds re these days only as much electricity in a year as renewables add every few days. So nuclear adds more power to the world. Uh, in the same power that it adds in a year is being added by renewables right now every few days. And of course, that's expanding. Fun fact, China is now installing wind and solar capacity equivalent to five new nuclear reactors every week. Yeah, just suck on that for a while. The last wow. blackouts on California's main grid were August 14th and 15th. Not this year, but in 2020. Why? Because there was no batteries at the time, hardly. Now there is. And guess what? No blackouts. But you would have people, politicians on the right, say, renewables will crash our grid. You will come home to burst water pipes. Opposite is true. The absolute opposite is true. The battery degradation rate in modern EVs has gone down by almost 25% in the last five years. Probably because all the... The crappy um, Nissan Leafs have been out uh, flanked by other brands because we, <laughs> there was a terrible battery in that. Mine's only like 60% of what it used to be, but not bad for the worst battery ever made. I'm still running that vehicle until the uh, French suspension falls apart any day now, which I dread. It's happening, Brian. The IEA confirms world oil demand growth is slowing sharply and surging EV demand is uh, taking up the slack. China's high-speed rail network is also a part of that because they've expanded their high-speed rail and the accelerating global clean uh, tech rollout are a big part of the reasons why. Chile produced 9.4% of its primary energy from solar in last year. That is the highest of any country that year. And finally this week, what am I going to do? I'm going to talk to uh, the tweet from Assad Razuk's weekly tweet on good climate news. This happens every week on his Twitter feed. And every week, there is a plethora of good stories that just will blow your mind every single week. We try to cover some of them here on the show. 
He says, number one, global oil demand growth slowing sharply, says the IEA, the International Energy Agency. Number two, Britain's reliance on coal-fired power set to end after 140 years. We mentioned that on the show before. Um, three, oil products demand in China peaked in 2023. Number four, California able to keep the lights on this summer due to extreme heat waves, in large part because of battery deployment. Just mentioned that. Number five, China plans to include steel, cement, and aluminum in its carbon market from 2024 on. That's good because industry is hard to decarbonize. And boy, howdy, they are working on it over there. Asian Development Bank to devote 50% of its annual lending to climate finance. Uh, that's good. And it shows the speed of renewables over there. UK blocks approval of the first coal mine in 30 years. Also mentioned on the show. Scotland's only oil refinery to close next year. Oh, I wish mine would close. What a life I would have here if that I would dance for days. The Hague uh, the, is the first city to ban fossil fuel ads mentioned on the show this week. And uh, tens of thousands in South Korea protest a lack of climate pro progress. That's good to hear. China's top economic planner announces that the country will accelerate the construction of a new power system. So they are not sitting on their laurels. They are saying, hey, we got all these renewables. Let's upgrade the power system and make it different and new. Uh, big oil faces rapidly rising number of climate lawsuits, he says in his last tick. And that is it for the lightning round. That is basically a roundup of all of our favorite topics here on uh, the Clean Energy Show. And that's it for this week. You can contact us at Clean Energy Show at gmail.com. And we're all over social media as Clean Energy Pod. We'll see you again in seven days. See you next week. The Clean Energy Show.